killed during the uh, dropping of the bomb on Hiroshima, upcoming then. Welcome very, very much to Conversations, where we're pleased on this August 5th, 1987, uh, the 42nd anniversary of the dropping of the bomb on Hiroshima, the atomic bomb, to welcome to the program a documentary filmmaker who has made a most interesting film about that experience with a unique, uh, a unique aspect to understanding the implications of it, and that being Gary DeWalt. And Mr. DeWalt is a uh, filmmaker and a documentarian who's written a very, uh, made a, a very interesting film having to do with the death of Americans that were happening to be prisoners of war in uh, Hiroshima at the time of the bomb. And Gary, welcome very, very much to Conversations. Thank you. Thank you. I wonder if you might share with me, before we get into the specifics of the film and so forth, um, your own background uh, as, a, as a filmmaker, you, you've been interested in that for some time, and maybe, maybe you could talk about how you got into filmmaking, if you would, and, doc and, and to the documentary experience, and then maybe we could lead that up to the specifics of this particular film. Well, documentary filmmaking has been often referred to as the accidental industry. I think there are very few of us who are in it who started out to, uh, to be filmmakers, per se. I was trained initially as an economist. Mm -hmm. uh, I worked for 13 years then as a publisher in the area of economics and in uh, anthropology. And in 79, I uh, decided to become a documentary filmmaker and moved to Santa Fe, New Mexico, where I set up my company there. That's a pretty big shift. Was it did some things that led up to that? Or? Well, the west side, uh -huh. the upper west side, is a little different than uh, the mountain side of, uh, of Santa Fe. Indeed. But, uh, mm -hmm. Well, as a documentary filmmaker, you're traveling around a great deal, and uh, I have four sons mm -hmm. and uh, was interested in having them grow up in the Southwest. I myself am from the Southwest, mm -hmm. so, uh, and, and being a documentary filmmaker, traveling as you do, it's, it's a matter of unpacking bags and, and washing your clothes and then leaving <laughs> again. Yeah, and, uh, it's a little bit easier to get into Santa Fe for that. Yeah, I see. Yeah, and the the um, the, the the interest that you had in the in the subject here, the the the, uh, the bombing at Hiroshima and the implications to uh, that of there being Americans there and so forth. How did you happen to become to focus on that particular subject of the of the specific uh, film that we're talking about here? Well, originally I had been interested in the political decision-making process that uh, led up to the dropping of the bomb. Mm -hmm. From the point where Leo Szilard, Hungarian physicist, uh, went to Einstein to draft a letter to send to Roosevelt, up through the Pacific commanders uh, demanding a, a written order for the mm -hmm. dropping of the bomb on Hiroshima, that paper trail, uh, went to Dr. Barton Bernstein at Stanford University who is an expert uh, on the Truman administration, the, uh, the dropping of the atomic bomb, mm -hmm. and realized that that paper trail had been interrupted in various places. Some information is still classified, uh, some diaries still under wraps. <clears throat> so put that idea aside for the moment, and uh, it was during our conversations that he happened to mention to me that uh, in 1977, a Japanese researcher had discovered in a military archive a list of American POW victims mm -hmm. that to that date, uh, that was in 1980 when I saw him, uh, that to 1980 the U.S. government had declined to make any definitive comment about American victims. That there had been any American victims of the dropping of the bomb at all. Well, I, I should make a distinction yeah. here. There were a number of Americans who who were killed. I wouldn't certainly would not want to suggest that these prisoners of war were the only Americans. That oh. happens to be the subject of the film. But yeah. there were a large number of Japanese Americans who either had been trapped uh, in Japan prior to the outbreak of the war, or individuals who, rather than be locked into internment uh, camps in the United States, had Return uh -huh, to Japan. Uh -huh, uh -huh. Um, so, uh, you know, the, the uh, I just wanted to yeah. make that. No, I understand. I understand. Yeah, right. yeah. Or even some people I think have brought up uh, 
So what we're talking about are people who have been, uh, I, I think as I understand it, fil uh, uh, flyers who were flying uh, missions and so forth that have been shot down, happened to be, have been taken prisoner and were there very near the epicenter where the bomb went off. And these were American flyers that, or American soldiers or pers service personnel who were killed by that bomb. And that fact had been overlooked or had been not been brought forth in terms of the the longer record, or no particular attention given to that over Well, the when people started making inquiries, there were stories published in Japan. Uh -huh. <clears throat> Those stories found their way to the United States. Uh -huh. uh, the New York Times began to pursue the story. Uh, United Press began to pursue the story. Uh, but the response that they were getting from the Defense Department was that the records that were necessary to make a definitive statement about whether or not these individuals who had been listed uh, that those documents had been destroyed in a fire in a military barracks in St. Louis in 1973 mm. or four years prior to the time that the inquiry began. Yeah. Uh -huh. uh, and that's where it was in 1980. We had a list of names from the Japanese, <clears throat> but no, uh, you know, no documentary evidence from the U.S. government that these deaths had in fact existed. Oh, there, there were a specific form, 293 or something, there was a specific form for listing uh, those who were killed in action and so forth. That's right. We stumbled on that. Uh, well, it wasn't accidentally. Uh, we, uh, I say we, one of my research assistants and I pursued uh, old trails for yeah. about a year uh -huh. and got the same response. But we began to develop sources on the periphery, people that we thought might have had access to that kind of information. And a woman in the Veterans Administration who worked in the Memorial Affairs Office I'd spoken with her on several occasions uh, with very little help. Uh, and one day she called me in my office in Santa Fe. This is uh, mm -hmm. after the research had been going on for, oh, between six months and a year, mm -hmm. saying that uh, she had given it a considerable amount of thought, uh, thought that the story ought to be told, and uh, that the Army, uh, specifically the Office of the Adjutant General, uh, did have documents which would support the Japanese claims. Mm -hmm. And those she identified as 293 files, which are files that are created when someone is declared either missing in action or killed in action. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And uh, working from the Japanese list with names, uh, we began then to make inquiries of the Adjutant General using the Freedom of Information Act and slowly, one by one, the files began to come out of their offices, the 293 files that said mm. specifically killed by the atomic bomb. Yeah, that's interesting that there would be that notation for some of those people that were thus killed. And the, the, uh, the records that had supposedly been lost was a different group of records that you've been on the trail of and that uh, these were the ones that were able to give you a clear picture of what actually happened. Well, the Freedom of Information picture. Act, I'm, I'm sure as, you, uh, mm. as you're well aware, uh, does not uh, allow you to uh, uh, to go fishing with uh, yeah, you have with, to ask a, a specific, thing, a specific right? question uh -huh. and so previous investigators had had been successful in getting personnel files mm -hmm. or what are called 201 files mm -hmm. uh, indicating that they had some interest in finding out what had happened to these people the personnel files were not uh, were not forthcoming, yeah, right. but the 293 files, uh, there was no doubt about it. They, they indicated that these individuals had been killed by the bomb. You don't think, there was a, do you think, just, just to get a straightness over, you don't think, was there, was there a, uh, an attitude on the part of, let's say, American authorities and so forth to try and keep uh, the fact that these people had been killed uh, by our bomb and so forth away from public consciousness or anything of that sort actively, or it just hadn't come up? Uh, as being something particularly meaningful that this, uh, what, 10 to 20 people that were killed right. there, these flyers that were killed, wasn't, it wasn't as though it was trying to be, in a certain sense, try to have us not identified with those deaths uh, with our dropping of the bomb. It's a question that I, you know, since then I have continued some investigations. Uh, during the time that I was involved in making the film, five years, and since then, you know, I've never found a, uh, a document or, or I've never found anything that would indicate that there was a, a formal policy to withhold the information. It is interesting, however, to note that the letters and telegrams that were sent to the surviving family members 
uh, specifically the next of kin. At the time, been, yeah. That's right. Yeah. The next of kin that had been specified mm -hmm. uh, by these individual soldiers. Uh, the telegrams and the uh, letters that were sent only went so far as to say that the individual had been killed while a prisoner of war of the Japanese on August the 6th, 1945. Mm -hmm. Without identifying the Without cause. identifying the, uh, the actual cause of, mm -hmm. their, of their individual deaths. Mm -hmm. uh, I found that a little less than forthcoming. Whether or not there was an, a, an organized uh, you know, or a thoughtful consideration consideration yeah. to withholding that information, I can't say. I've not found a smoking gun. No, no. Well, it's not necessarily that. Or also, it's just a broader question about the attitude of the American people themselves about having initiated such an act. I mean, some people see that as having been a horrendous, uh, barbaric act, a uh, dropping of a bomb that was able to obliterate 100,000 human beings at such a time. Other people felt it was the fortunes of war. And there's different attitudes nationally. And That's I suppose true. in international context, there's a broader attitude toward that about there's certain questions of guilt, and there's certain questions of atomic uh, weaponry and so forth. Oh, and there's, that there's been a change. By that. Sure, mm -hmm. sure, and there's been a change over time. I, I recall reading a comment uh, that was made by Studs Terkel, who mm -hmm. admitted rather openly that uh, uh, with you know, the, uh, the being very pleased at the news of the dropping of the atomic bombs in Japan, uh, and of course years later, as with other people who had an opportunity to, to reflect and also to consider the reality of what had happened there. He certainly has a much different position uh, today. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Uh, uh, it's, I am surprised, however, at the extent to which those, feel those feelings or those attitudes still prevail mm -hmm. among some members of the population. Mm -hmm. that, that the atomic bomb was simply a, a way of ending World War II and somehow has no life beyond that fact. Yeah. Uh, and that was one of the motivations, I think, for making the film. Yeah, that's one of the principal questions, perhaps, before the uh, agenda, the human agenda, that was how to deal with these terrible weapons of destruction that, unfortunately, since the time of Hiroshima, have grown in ever greater dimensions. So the problems are still there. Uh, you probably have had it asked to you why, when there were 100,000 uh, human beings uh, killed and so forth, you put such attention on these handful of Americans and so forth, and I suppose you've thought about that, and uh, as there's a part of the film here that's going to make it possible for us to see who some of these people were, but I wonder if maybe you might want to just address that question, which is brought up uh, from time to time. That's right. Uh, when I first decided to, to make the film, one of the first things that I did was sit down and write a letter to uh, Robert, Dr. Robert Lifton, who then was at Yale, mm -hmm. uh, who has spent a considerable amount of his professional life looking into uh, the psychosocial impact of the use of nuclear weapons. Uh, his book, uh, Death and Life, about the survivors of Hiroshima, is, is a classic in the field. Mm -hmm. And I explained to him that I was a little bit concerned about making the film uh, lest it be taken the wrong way, that uh, I was encouraged by the fact that I could use this story as a rhetorical device, device to, in effect, bring the bomb home. Mm -hmm. It was not a matter of lack of concern for the hundred, uh, I think, hundred and fifty thousand uh, plus victims of Hiroshima. Uh, it was that concern that led me to this story in the first place. Mm -hmm. It was the discovery of this of this small sidebar story, if you will, that uh, presented me with an opportunity to create a film that I could bring, I think I said to Dr. Lifton, to bring the bomb home and put it on yeah. the back porches of people in Kansas City. Yeah, I understand. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah, absolutely. Because there, And it also underscores in a sort of more metaphoric way the fact that the Bomb isn't something, or the, 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 the nature of weaponry itself isn't something that just necessarily is projected outward at some outer enemy. It's something that has repercussions right back home as we begin to approach an era where we have atomic weaponry where no one could win in a certain sense. Do you understand what I mean? It's not, it's a different concept. Of the, the weaponry has a certain kind of connotation to it itself. Well, it's non discriminatory, it mm. kills everybody. Yeah, can well do. Well, the film, of course, is Ken Wakushi, is, uh, is yes. the film meaning in Japanese uh, killed by the uh, atomic bomb, killed by the atomic killed bomb. Killed by the atomic bomb. That's a, that's a, 
a Roth, but, but uh, liter it's a literal translation. Yes, and uh, it's being shown here, of course, in, by the Japan Society. And you, we have some clips of the film that we want to share with the people here. And we have one, as I understand it, that is going to show some of the people that were Mr. Cartwright or Pilot Cartwright and some of the people. Maybe you could set it up for us here. We could show the folks some uh, a piece of the film here about some of the people. Maybe you could share with us what it is that's being shown here, this film that you're so familiar with. Fine. The sequence that, uh, that we're going to look at uh, identifies the people who were killed in the blast, and it explains by uh, what means and under what circumstances they came to uh, to be in Hiroshima, to be captured, and to be in the city at the time the bomb was dropped, and so that's what we'll be seeing. Okay, well, let's roll that now, then. Fine. Okay, very good. Durden Looper was a crew member of a B-24 bomber nicknamed the Lonesome Lady. This aircraft, which carried a crew of nine men, was downed by Japanese anti-aircraft fire on July 28, 1945. Six members of the bomber's crew are known to have been in Hiroshima when the atomic bomb was dropped on August 6. Lieutenant Thomas Cartwright, who was the plane's pilot, recalls the men he lost at Hiroshima. Darden Looper was the co-pilot, very uh, close to his family. He had a wife and uh, a child born while he was uh, in the Air Force. So he wanted to go back and uh, uh, be a farmer. You know, if we'd been in any place long enough, he would have planted a garden, surely. Jim Ryan was the bombardier on our crew, and uh, he was uh, from New York, upstate New York, a uh, very likable sort of fella. He uh, was perhaps a little different from the rest of us, being uh, more of an urban orientation. I think he was probably the, the youngest member of the crew. Hugh Atkinson was the uh, radio operator, always... Uh, with a smile and uh, always uh, with some sort of uh, light comment. Probably the most popular fellow on the crew all the way around. Everybody liked Hugh. We called him Huggy. I don't know why. It, his wife didn't like it, uh, either Huggy or, or uh, Huey. And uh, he's just a very nice sort of fellow. Buford Ellison... Uh, came to us uh, from the uh, glider uh, uh, outfit, and we always kidded Buford and uh, told him he was a propeller expert in the glider operation. He was a very quiet sort of fella from Texas, a uh, farm ranch boy, fell in with the crowd, uh, was always uh, part of the crowd, and uh, like most of us, being in the Army and getting out and seeing uh, new places uh, was quite an experience, but probably a little more for Buford than any of the rest of us. Uh, he was maybe a little bit overwhelmed by all of the Army and the new places. Johnny Long uh, <clears throat> was the uh, waste gunner. He was the oldest member of the crew. He worked in the steel mills before uh, joining the Air Force. He was married. Just a, a real nice guy. He felt maybe a little bit fatherly toward the rest of us. And uh, he was uh, our carpenter, and uh, he uh, looked after all of the mechanical things uh, for us. He smuggled a tool kit, carpenter kit, on the plane and took it over so we could... Uh, have our own little private uh, tool shop. Ralph Neal uh, joined the crew uh, as a replacement, and I really don't know uh, very much about Ralph Neal at all. And he just uh, came on to our crew, and uh, uh, unfortunate, certainly for him, that uh, he uh, joined us on that day and uh, really wasn't needed on the crew.
Dennis Cartwright's bomber was a member of the 866th Bombardment Squadron of the 494th Bombardment Group. On the morning of July 28th, it departed Okinawa as part of a multiple plane force. The objective was to bomb the BB Haruna, a Japanese battleship anchored in Kure Harbor, 15 kilometers southeast of Hiroshima. The flying time to the target, four hours. Lieutenant Cartwright's plane had been stripped down for the mission. Some of its machine guns had been removed in order to increase the plane's bomb load. Ralph Neal, who was a gunner, was not needed on the flight because he had no guns to fire. The crew had been told to expect little or no fighter aircraft opposition, but they were warned to anticipate heavy anti-aircraft defense in the area of their target. As they approached Kure Harbor, the bomber attack force flew into a dense pack of clouds. Visibility was severely restricted. Lieutenant Cartwright and his co-pilot, Durden Looper, kept looking for a glimpse at the target, and in a brief moment at a break in the covering clouds, they saw the Haruna. Over their target, the bomb load was released, and just a few moments later, the lonesome lady was hit by anti-aircraft fire. We were over the uh, bay outside of Curie Harbor when we were hit and we started down. We'd lost uh, power in one or two engines and we were starting down. I still had some control of the plane. Bill Abel was in the tail gunner position and uh, he saw the smoke. His intercom was knocked out. He was out of communication and Bill was pretty tricky pretty quick on the trigger anyway and as soon as we uh, uh, got to land we came to landfall and uh, went over land Bill bailed out uh, Buford Ellison was uh, in the key position and he was flying that day as the engineer to and he would uh, he emptied all of the fire extinguishers and it had no effect on the blaze whatsoever and uh, uh, Buford came running up to me saying, it, it's, it's no hope, bail out, bail out. And uh, I told him, no, I still have control. Let's not leave it yet. Let's try to get back to see where they can pick us up. And uh, Buford kept telling me it was hopeless. And about that time, it was beginning to go out of control, and I ordered bail out. I bailed out pretty close to the ground. I jumped out, counted three, opened my parachute. The greatest shock in my life was that jolt from a parachute opening. I thought it would be nice and smooth like diving in water, but it's, <coughs> it's a kabam. It really jolts you. And I don't know, I got a real brief look at the countryside, and then I was on the ground. Tom Cartwright and Durden Looper parachuted into a wooded area just outside of Hiroshima. On the evening of July 28th, they were held under guard in a small village. On July 29th, they were taken, bound and blindfolded, into the city of Hiroshima. Well, it's poignant. I mean, these are people that are going to have been uh, involved in the, in, in the destruction and, and so forth. Uh, that, was that, where was, how was that film footage gotten? Or where did you get that, if I may? The uh, 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 the question is, has been asked before, and people often think that it's a it's a recreation yeah. of the uh, of the events. But mm. uh, uh, at the time, we decided to include this information about how they happened to to be in the area of Hiroshima. We took their outfit and we began to search in the National Archives, to, mm -hmm. uh, and also at the Defense Audiovisual Agency out in uh, California to see if there was any existing film footage on their particular unit. Yeah. Uh, and uh, we were incredibly lucky in that regard in that a uh, color documentary, uh, color film had only recently been introduced uh, uh, into the Signal Corps for the purpose of making military documentaries. They had cho chosen that specific unit 
to begin a documentary film about in color. Mm -hmm. And this was only about six weeks prior to the time that the atomic bomb was dropped. Mm -hmm. And so we were presented with hundreds of feet of, of extremely well-preserved uh, color color footage on that particular unit yeah. that Tom Cartwright belonged to. Yeah, that's right. And Tom Cartwright happened to have been able to sur survive the yes. event, having been sent to Tokyo uh, just prior to the dropping of the bomb. That's right. Mm -hmm. and, the, and it was interesting also that the, the, the attitude on the part of the Japanese authorities was cooperative in terms of helping to put this film together, and the people that were involved as far as Japan is concerned in accessing what footage could be done and that sort of thing. And no, what was their attitude toward it, I mean, in a certain sense, of you're doing this project? Well, at the, uh, at the governmental level, uh, there was a considerable amount of help. Indeed, uh, the offices of NHK, which is you know, very much like our PBS here, mm -hmm. uh, was extremely helpful uh, in lending uh, resources in uh, vouching for this film crew. Uh, we had to have security clearances and security badges. They spoke for us. And, mm -hmm. uh, uh, and in fact, we in, 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 we were wearing NHK identification all the time we were in Japan, and I it see. opened a considerable number of doors. For yes, us. I can imagine. Yeah. Huh? Um, everyone that we wanted to talk to, uh, without reservation, uh, agreed to to talk to us. Uh, and indeed, I went over with a list of about ten people that I wanted to talk to. Uh, thinking that if I got five, I would, I would be quite happy. And uh, I think we came back with something like 15 interviews, mm -hmm. including mm -hmm. the original 10. So it was an extremely cooperative situation. Uh, I think one of the, the interesting things that did happen to us, just prior to the time that we left the States, I had submitted a Freedom of Information Act to the Surgeon General's office asking to get access to a lot of still photographs mm -hmm. that had been taken uh, immediately after the dropping of the bomb and had been informed that an agreement had been struck with the Japanese back in the late 1970s uh, to return all of this material, and they were in process returning it, mm -hmm, mm -hmm. and that it was currently unavailable. And so I wrote back a letter saying that that put me in a, a bit of a catch-22 mm -hmm. situation, that if it belonged to the Japanese, I, I could make an inquiry of them, mm -hmm. but if this was in transit, it presented a bit of a problem. So I asked, again, submitted a Freedom of Information Act request asking what had been sent when. Mm -hmm. Went to Japan and went to uh, a research center in Hiroshima and was given the use of a uh, very large work area and, and notebooks and binders full of still photographs. Mm -hmm. And I asked uh, later uh, about... Uh, well, I said that I appreciated it very much and that it must be a very valuable resource for journalists. And they said that I was the first one to utilize yes. the material. Mm -hmm. And I was a bit surprised by that until I came back to the States and discovered that indeed an agreement had been signed with the Japanese back in the late 70s. And upon the signing of the agreement, 10% of the material had been shipped. Mm -hmm. The 90% of the balance of the material, which was shipped to the institute where I worked, was uh, shipped two days after my Freedom of Information inquiry was made. Mm -hmm. So. Mm -hmm. uh, the act works, but in very mysterious ways. <laughs> yeah, I, know. I guess, in a certain sense, then uh, the Japanese, having been the only people that had that devastation delivered down upon them at Hiroshima and Nagasaki, have uh, scars, psychic scars, and other kinds of attitudes toward it. And uh, as I understand, there's parts of the film that are depicting um, the destruction itself that actually was taken at the time or that, that shows some of that and uh, maybe you could we could show another clip that would in a certain sense uh, have to do with uh, you know uh, the the, uh, the event itself and the, the destruction of it the destructiveness of it and the attitude of some of the Japanese people at the time and so forth that's fine let's yeah. do that okay all right that's running uh, is there th this is set up there's a uh, a, a, a protagonist or of mr. Someone who was a prison guard or something, or Fujit? Uh, it, was a, it was a lieutenant, uh, Nobuichi Fukui, yeah. uh, who was in the Army. Uh, he was 40, year, uh, 40 years old and a lieutenant, which uh, made him something of an oddity. It was a fairly low rank for uh -huh. someone of that age. But as he explained it to me, uh, he had converted to Christianity as a, uh, as a young man 
and uh, was also an English speaker. Uh, and uh, he was in a position where he was not very highly regarded by the military establishment, but all the same was in the military. Uh -huh. And uh, after the bomb was dropped, uh, you know, two people did survive and later died of radiation sickness, and we know about that because another group of Americans who had been captured after the bomb blast were brought in mm -hmm. uh, and they came into contact two weeks later this is now about the 19th of August mm -hmm. uh, these people who had been shot down were brought into contact with the two fellows who were dying of radiation sickness yeah. so there were 12 people there under guard uh, literally oh, a thousand yards perhaps from Hypo Center Mm -hmm. uh, in a hole in the ground where they were being held prisoner. And uh, this Lieutenant Fukui was called in by his commanding officer and he was told that the war is coming to an end and these prisoners are no longer necessary for us mm -hmm. and you may kill them if you wish. Mm -hmm. And he protested very, very loudly mm -hmm. and uh, said that uh, he wanted to evacuate the prisoners to take them outside of the city of Hiroshima where mm -hmm. he felt like they were in danger. Yeah, yeah. And so we'll, uh, what, what we'll see in the film clip is uh, uh, a discussion by Fukui and also a couple of the prisoners who were on the back of that truck. Yeah, very good, very good. Okay, let's run that. Uh, okay. Ralph Neal, Norman Brissett, and thousands of Japanese were suffering from their exposure to radiation. The city was a heap of rubble, scattered with human remains and burning funeral pyres. Military control of the city had been established, and the question of what to do with the 12 POWs then in Hiroshima arose. Military policeman Lieutenant Fukui was called to his superior's office. He was told the American prisoners were no longer important. He could kill them if he wished. And he said... Was war was over. Prisoners are necess unnecessary. You may treat freely. I asked him, You may treat freely. What do you mean? Oh, kill or arrive, you are free. So I made a great quarrel. Do you know the prisoners' treaty, international treaty in Hague? Japanese delegates signed instead of Japanese emperor. So that Hague prisoner treaty is valuable. Amidst the chaos that remained in Hiroshima and the fierce anger that existed toward Americans, Lieutenant Fukui took a dangerous and bold step. He questioned his superior's intentions and reminded him of the Geneva Convention. After a brief discussion, the officer agreed with Lieutenant Fukui and told him he would issue an order authorizing the safe evacuation of POWs from Hiroshima. You are theory, I think, right. Uh, I will try to give you the order to treat prisoners warmly. So I said, your document is necessary for us. Otherwise, we cannot treat them warmly. Just, oh yes, we will give you tomorrow uh, nice order sheet. At dusk on the evening of August 17th, Lieutenant Fukui commandeered an open-bed military truck and driver and drove to the area where the American POWs were being held. Uh, this Japanese lieutenant came in and said that there was a party starting up outside the revetment that could have been detrimental to our health. And uh, so he was coming back with a truck to move us. And I uh, went to uh, Teng Aviator's uh, house near Hiroshima Station. And I ordered them 
All gentlemen, stand up. Attention, stand up. Turn to right. Here's the truck. You may s- uh, march slowly. Come in, come in. And uh, we climbed aboard this uh, truck. We were again blindfolded. And I can't remember exactly the details of how we got Brissett and Neil up into the truck that we did put up in the truck. Many audience assembled near the truck. Come here, come here. Uh, MP officers uh, treat the f- prisoners in English, not Japanese. Come in, come in. So many audience assembled. But I know the international law, so I worried. We drove a short distance when he stopped the truck, got out of the front of the truck and came around the back, told us to take our blindfolds off, stand up, and look at how Hiroshima was. He explained to us that the Americans had dropped this horrible bomb on Hiroshima, had completely destroyed Hiroshima, and how inhumane the Americans were to drop such a horrible bomb. The military police lieutenant... uh explained what an inhumane act the dropping of this bomb on the town of Hiroshima was, and that uh, something in the nature of 150,000 people had been killed outright, and uh, that uh, we should be ashamed to be a party to such dastardly deeds, etc., etc. And I ordered the driver to stop. And I said, look there, that blue light firing are women's burning. It's the baby is burning. Is it wonderful to see the babies burning? The comment about the lecture that we, we got uh, how inhumane we were to drop this uh, new weapon and so forth on the Japanese people and kill all the innocent civilians, etc., etc. Uh, one of the fellows spoke up and he said, Did you ever hear of Bataan? And that was the only comment that was made. As we looked around, uh, we could see that everything was completely destroyed, just like a steamroller had rolled over all the buildings, and all that was left was just rubble. And we must have been fairly near the center because nothing was vertical. Uh, Block after block, the streets had been cleared so you could see outlines of where the blocks were. But in between, there was nothing. The only complete piece of equipment that I saw were two barber chairs sticking up out of the rubble. Some of them said, please allow me to say, our hearts. But I said that my mission is to carry them as quick as possible in safe. But we are not sufficient time to talk together. Go on. And then we reached to Uzina branch. After a 20-minute drive, Lieutenant Fukui delivered his prisoners to a military police station in Ujina, an area to the south of the city center. We drove into this villa. There was a pump in the middle of the, of the little um, circle, and he allowed us to wash off. This was the first time we had a chance to wash up after coming out of the water. Our clothes were filthy, dirty. We had salt water sores. Our lips were cracked. We had not shaved and we hadn't washed or taken care of ourselves in all those days. After we all washed up a little bit, why, he put us in uh, little cages. Four of us were in the first cell, and there was a corridor down which evidently housed three or four more cells. Uh, Neil uh, and Brissette 
who were the two fellows that we had met, uh, were put in those cells down further down the corridor. Uh, a doctor was brought in and uh, checked us out physically. And uh, when it was all over, he asked us if we knew of anything that would help him save uh, some of the, oh, I guess he used a figure of a thousand people a day that were still dying from the, uh, as a result of the dropping of the bomb. But we uh, we told him that, uh, you know, we knew, uh, knew of an atomic bomb, but we didn't know what the effects of it were. Uh, we couldn't offer anything, being not being medically trained or anything else. The 19th of uh, the 19th of uh, August at two o'clock in the morning, uh, Ralph Neal died. And later on, I was able to make an entry into my diary book. And it says here that Staff Sergeant Ralph J. Neal, 803 Street, Corbin, Kentucky, 866 Squadron of the 499th Group, Group H. Of uh, died at Hiroshima at 0200 on August the 19th, 1945. Later that day, Norman Brissett died. Both he and Ralph Neal were buried beside a road that ran near the Eugenia Military Police Station to which they had been taken. Well, that brings home the devastation and uh, the, some of the, the, the human suffering that's involved with this. It, retreats in the mind of men. The United States have been singularly lucky in not having ever had such destruction raining down on us here. And I wonder uh, what the lessons of this might be. I know we want to say another print. The, the destructiveness of the atomic weaponry, the destructiveness of the atomic weaponry that's, uh, that's developed since the time when first we dropped the bomb and so forth, raises what is probably the single most important uh, issue confronting the broad human community as, were, as it were is how and uh, under what conditions and the imperativeness of our being able to uh, deal with or, or, or have some way of, um, of uh, uh, avoiding uh, another example of that or another use of these kind of weapons. That's part of the pr central problem or area of concern confronting us now, how we can avoid the use of these terrible weapons of destruction that have evolved. And I wonder if there's enough uh, awareness of that or if there can be enough awareness of the significance of that by, let's say, Americans or others who might view this film or just the broad general issue. Well, I think from the moment that you leave uh, Hiroshima and, and Nagasaki, I mean, from that, from that point, and this is something that Dr. Lifton has talked uh, a great deal about mm -hmm. in, in his own work, is the uh, you know is the death of symbolic immortality mm -hmm. that uh, we now have the the capacity to uh, to end it all we we have that more than that capacity right now to to end it all by any all you mean we have enough weapons capacity for us to render the earth incapable of the continued support of the human species of, sus of sustaining the, the life form that you and I have yeah uh, yes right. seems to be we don't have enough to destroy life we don't have some doomsday machine that could send the earth into smithereens and just have life itself obliterated but we have and do we know well scientifically that we do in fact have that capacity to render life a uh, human human life uh, uh, obsolete, as it were. I mean, I, I, I don't know myself whether or not we have crossed that Promethean line. Uh, well, I think there are some biologists uh, who, in my neighborhood, on my old neighborhood on the Upper West Side, who would mm -hmm. argue that the cockroach might stay behind. Oh but, well, oh uh, certainly. Or Walter Sullivan at one yeah. time wrote a very interesting piece where he went in a bathyscope or some sort of a new device that allowed him to go into the ocean deep, a mile deep or something, and he had pieces in there, and he said that there are exotic phosphorescent life forms, worms and other phosphorescent. And he said, rather matter of fact, in the article three or four times, these are the forms of life that are most likely to survive. Uh, so that evolution, we've got two billion years to supernova or something, so evolution would continue. We don't, we haven't crossed the line where we could yet in our 
you know, Promethean cave, destroy life. But it does seem that we actually have crossed the line where we could destroy a habitat that support our species, and that's a pretty monumental. Well, I, I think it's a whole sweep sure. of human history, a pretty monumental sure. kind of line we've crossed or something well, in I, our generation of living. Sure. Yeah, well, I think about that. I, I think most, uh, you know, most people do think about that from, from time to time. But there's another positive side to that, too, and that is, you know, what action we can take uh, as individuals to, uh, to reverse that situation. And mm -hmm. we're, not, uh, we're, not without, we're not without power. Mm -hmm. Without power in that regard, yeah. so uh, I think it's never it's never too late to make your own voice heard. At that point, when we decide that it's it's too late for individual voices to be heard, I think it's I think maybe it is the end. It is too bad. So there are still voices that can be heard, and this film, if I may say, eloquently raises these uh, the, these issues throughout and brings it home in a very unique way. Congratulate tremendously on the film and Thank the you. Japan Society for showing it uh, here in New York as they are doing. And as I understand, the film ha is closed, it has a closing which addresses exactly those issues. I wonder if maybe you could uh, set that up for us, as I were, the closing of the film where these issues are. I think the pilot Cartwright is involved, and maybe you could set that up. I guess it deals with those very issues themselves. That's right. Again, uh, you know, the focus on the individuals, the American prisoners of war who were killed, Again, we're a you know a rhetorical device to raise a much larger question, which mm -hmm. which came home to everyone who was working on the film because we happened to be uh, filming in Hiroshima at the at one of the annual peace memorial services on August the sixth. And uh, for anyone who has not experienced that, it's uh, it's quite a it's quite a moving experience and one uh, one that you carry with you for the, mm -hmm. uh, for the rest of your life. Mm -hmm. uh, mm -hmm. And so the film at the end does talk about the, the implication of indiscriminate uh, use of, of atomic weapons. And it also deals with the amount of uh, public and social trauma that's been created by the uh, bombings of Hiroshima and Nagasaki, and also consciously living under that threat on a on a day to day basis. Mm -hmm. And uh, the end of the film, uh, I hope, captures a bit of that sense of, of trauma, and yet also suggests uh, the hopefulness that's involved. And and by maintaining our singular and collective voices, that uh, we might finally put an end to this madness. We might be able to put an end to this madness, and if we do. And if we do find the means by which we could have the the affairs of mankind uh, resort to some conflict resolution, resort to something other than violence, and so if we, if we find a way to build the how was the term from Isaiah? The beat the plowshares into uh, or beat the spears into pruning hooks and uh, so forth. If we were able to do that, uh, it might be that we are at a moment of just as we reach the point of uh, where we have the ability to to literally destroy ourselves in some suicidal or murderous pact amongst ourselves. We also might be on the verge of some sort of almost millennial capability to overcome the ancient scourges that have been the basis for the fighting. So it could be seen in a positive sense, the human condition. Uh, do you understand what I'm saying? I mean, it's, sure. a, it's, well, it's, a, it's a time of great decision. People have probably felt that throughout all of history, but it really seems to be uniquely so in the time that you and I sit here and talk. Well, the difference between a grand dream and a grand nightmare is is the willingness of individuals to take action into their own hands mm -hmm. and to uh, demand, you know, a better a better quality of life and uh, to insist that this madness stops. And uh, one has to be an opt optimist, or or one has to be mad. Mm -hmm. One has to be an optimist, or or James Joyce said, "History is a nightmare from which we're attempting to awaken." And uh, that might be a, another line that deals with it. Let us, set, let us see the end of this film that, that makes that point then and Fine. at this point. Thank now. you.
もなく8時15分になります金を合図に原爆死没者の冥福と平和を祈り1分間の黙祷を捧げます一度ご起立願います黙祷を I do feel extremely fortunate and do feel very close to the feelings of the families who lost people there. And I, I, I think that the same thing could happen to me with my children. And、uh, I, I would do anything to try to spare that experience.
Paul, well, thank you really very much. I want to congratulate you on a tremendous film. I think it's, as you said before, there's an opportunity for us to, uh, to, to perhaps make the difference. It would seem to me your film has a great opportunity to help uh, make a difference in terms of understanding the significance of these, uh, of, of, these, uh, of these events historically and of the potential for perhaps positive action to avert the catastrophe that they pretend if, uh, if we don't. You said before, before we set that up, that uh, optimism and so forth. Are you personally, I mean, if you think of the human condition, are you personally optimistic as you contemplate the human condition? Or do some of the events that this documentary perhaps reveal and so forth lend you to a point of sometimes pessimism? Maybe it's not fair for me to ask, but I just wonder how you feel personally, having come through the experience of making this film. I think everyone, um, I think everyone in this country is impacted by the, the possibility. Mm -hmm. And to say that one is, uh, you know, is without, uh, is without fear, uh, that's really not your question. It's one mm -hmm. of negativity versus optimism. Mm -hmm. uh, and I'll say what I said a moment ago. I think you have to be either an optimist or I think you have to be mad in mm -hmm. the face of the practical realities yeah. that confront us. Yeah, and it would be that it walks a line there. There's an almost... Uh, many, uh, the psychic level, Mr. Lifton would have probably been able to write it, the psychic level of living under this kind of a terror, which in fact we have been living for so long, has to have its effects at some level even as we go. And you brought these things to a focus, and I really congratulate you tremendously. I certainly want to thank you for making thank the you. film. Thank you. Thank you. And I want to thank you particularly for participating here in Conversations, because it's been a, a great pleasure for, uh, for us to talk to you, and I thank you very much for sharing the film. I wish you all the very, very best of luck with that film in terms of raising consciousness about this issue and with your filmmaking career as you proceed. I appreciate it. Thank you. Not at all. It's been our pleasure. And again, congratulations to Japan Society for having sponsored this film showing here in New York City. Um, that's it for this uh, particular segment of Conversations on the uh, 42nd anniversary of the opening of the atomic era with the dropping of the bomb on Hiroshima. Happy to have been able to bring you this related subject matter to that. And we here on Conversations invite you to tune in again next week. We'll be coming back again next week. That's it for this particular segment. Um, once again, um, Mr. Walt, thank you really very, very much. Indeed. Thank you for the invitation. Good night. We'll see you next week.